Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the Correct Views. As I go live here, I notice that I am somewhat crooked. It, uh, well, here, I'll, I'll let I'll let her fix this as we do this. Christelle, the behind the scenes queen. Basically, I'm trying to run two cameras on one tripod. It's fine. I have a second to talk to you anyway while she fixes the camera because it's 9/11. And I've been meaning to talk about that when it arrived, and uh, of course the day is here. So here's what I'm going to say. There are two things that I believe that many of you listening to this do not believe, and there is enough evidence that it could go either way. Like, I don't know if I'm right on this or not, but I'm going to say this. Um... I believe two things. First of all, I believe that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Do I think, let me see how that, that looks beautiful. Crystal to the rescue. Um, there are two things. First of all, I believe that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And I also believe when George Bush said that they were sent to Syria, I believe in fact that they were sent to Syria. Now, originally, and I admit this, I backed the Iraq war because it was sold to us as the Iraqis were going to pay for it with oil. Anybody? Anybody seen that happen? No, you don't know. You have not. I also thought that the Patriot Act was going to be temporary. That's how it was sold to us. Does it look temporary? No, it doesn't. So it's not that I was a hypocrite. It's that what was told to me that was going to happen never happened. Second of all, I have uh, progressed in that I now believe that both Clinton and George Bush knew that something was amiss about 9-11. And if you don't believe that Clinton was also somewhat aware of something was brewing, then you have to believe that within nine months of his presidency, that George W. Bush was so unbelievably intelligent that he managed to allow the whole thing. And I don't believe that at all. I don't think anybody in their right mind would. I don't think he's as dumb as uh, people think he is, by the way. Uh, same with Dan Quayle. But I do think they're not the brightest president, vice president, that we've ever had, that's for sure. Um, but I think that they are underestimated uh, on, a, uh, on a larger scale. Why were our planes told to stand down, that kind of thing? Um, I'm sorry, I believe it was known about. Uh, I do want to go ahead and put this up. My God, I mean, let's just face it, this has been a nightmare since day one. <sighs> Reality check, more Americans are rethinking 9-11 from BenSwan.com, and this is very good news. Did you know that a third building fell on 9-11? That billboard is today over Times Square. It was placed there through donations to a campaign called Rethink 9-11. In fact, that group has placed posters and signs across the world from Australia to Canada, from San Francisco to right here in New York City. So what is Rethink 9-11, it asks? Wouldn't only a fringe group of people would still believe in questioning 9-11? Perhaps not, because today we will tell you about a new polling it shows that a majority of those polled either question the 9-11 this story or don't believe it at all. Um, there, are, there is the one gentleman here, Mr. Swan, that talks about why he doesn't believe in it. I'm going to read you the two interviews as to just go into this article uh, for the rest of it. But I'm going to go ahead and read a piece out of this real quick. And these two interviews, I think, are really interesting. So you look at this image of the building, and this is from Mr. Swan. Eh? He, uh, he knows very well. He is somebody that is a, an expert in this sort of... Uh, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Sambati, Mr. Swan, uh, is, is asking the questions. My fault, no teleprompter. Mr. Samboti uh, is, uh, in fact, a mechanical design engineer with 27 years of experience in the aerospace and communications when the set has fallen, doesn't that suck? We're live. All right, we're going to go with it. Um, they put real trees. Who knew? Um, Tony says, Bodie, a mechanical design engineer with 27 years experience in the aerospace and communication industries, 
and one of the 2,000 engineers calling for a new independent investigation of the collapse of Building 7 and the World Trade Center towers. Swan, interviewer, asks, um, to better understand the claims of A&E, uh, those are uh, architects and engineers questioning on that one one. The A&E for 911 Truth, I talked with Tony Samboti, a mechanical engineer, and he says, so you look at this image of the building falling. Again, NIST says that it's office fires that have caused this. You say, to give you another example, says Boti replies, there is no other example. Swan, no other example in the world. Says Boti, they have no other example. Swan, so this has never happened. This would be the first building in the world that has ever come down this way, he asks. Reply, and they say that. They say that thermal heat expansion caused it. But I say what caused it, and you can cut this out or leave it in, but I think they took out the core columns of the eight full stories, and that pulled in the ex exterior. When you have controlled dem demotion, and when you take the core out, demotion, D-M-O-T-I-O-N, that's the way it's worded, you pull the exterior and it comes down. When you take out eight stories, it all comes in. Swan, what happens if you leave half of them? If it is not a controlled demolition and you have a failure of some columns, then you have a partial collapse. It goes on, and I'm going to go on. It's 9-11 and this matters as my set falls like the Twin Towers. Says Bodhi, one of them, uh, the beams could not expand far enough, and if they could expand far enough, those stiffeners would stop the girder from falling. They were bonded. Swan asks, but for the person, for the people that say you have so many disagreements on the technical things, says Bodhi, no, no, it's much more than that. It can't happen. It would be sort of like me saying that you can put something that's half an inch wide, and if I push it a half inch, it will fall off this rail, and that is not true. That is not what we're saying. I want to go to the other part of this story real quick, and again, I urge you to look all of this up. I'm just bringing out a very, very small bit of information that does prove that 9-11 was, uh, was very much something that was inside and very much uh, known about plan, whatever word you want to put on it. Uh, it says, how do families of the 9-11 victims feel? Some agree, some don't. Bob McElvine lost his son on 9-11. McElvine says, Bobby, his son, had just started Merrill Lynch two or three weeks before 9-11. Bobby was VIP of media relations. He was going to be writer, and he was writing for a PR firm. And their only client was Merrill Lynch. And they loved his writing so much that they hired him. That day, Merrill Lynch was holding a training on the 106th floor of the North Tower. No one was able to get a hold of Bobby. The tower was hit. We weren't that worried because we knew that he worked at Merrill Lynch. 150 people called him that morning, and no one ever got a response. I'll tell you what, I, I'm a very loved individual, but I don't know if 150 people would call to check on me. That's, that's, uh, they, I'd say his story was pretty credible. Swan, but if he worked at Merrill Lynch, why was he in the North Tower? McIlvain, well, this is what we are guessing, because Merrill Lynch was sponsoring a seminar on the 106th floor. Now, this is where it gets very, very important. He gets a coroner's report. Now, for those of you that have a thinking part of your brain, stay with me, because when you do, your blood will turn to freeze, to quote Vince Neal. McElvain. I got up to the morgue, talked to the doctor who examined him. He gave me the pictures. He asked me if I wanted to see the actual pictures, and I didn't want to see. I felt bad about it, but no matter how you look at it, he got hit by a sudden... Force. He was impacted by something. Yeah, a force. The top of his head was taken out. His right arm was blown off and his body had lacerations. If he had been on the 106th floor, which is what they said, we would have heard from him because a lot of people would have been calling out on the 106th floor. In other words, one of the 150 people that tried to get a hold of him, in fact, he probably would have picked up, at least to have said, goodbye, I'm scared, I'm dying. 
You all still with me? Good, because it gets much more frightening. But part of that autopsy revealed that Bobby was not killed by being burned. In fact, the burns he received came after he had died. McIlvain. Well, didn't the plane, well, I mean, did, wait, before I get to him, didn't the planes, Sam, is burning to death when they hit? No. Listen. So post-mortem means that he had burns after he died. I can say with confidence that Bobby died, and I can say with confidence before the planes hit. Because again, if the planes and its twin towers, then his injuries are ones that he would have sustained on impact that would have been burning him at the same time. Anybody that's ever watched any of these uh, documentary murder mystery things about how police catch criminals, they do so by following the coroner's report and they can tell you whether or not someone died before or after they were burned. It's, it's a matter of fact. It happens every day in courts of law. So the point is, he says, that the planes had nothing to do with his death and I could prove that in a court of law pretty easily. And therefore, if the planes had nothing to do with his death, who killed him? The claims being made by Bob and Tony are compelling. Uh, yeah, I would say very compelling. Because we now have proof that the buildings must have been exploded or something caused that after he had died. The planes hit under the floor that the man's son was on. And I'm so frustrated because so many people are not going to follow the whole thing on this. And that's even more frustrating because this, it's just such a very, very big, big deal. I wanted to put the article up one more time for you. Go read the whole thing. Yeah. I'm going to go on now to the American Dream, Michael Snyder, Precious Little Girl Dismembered While She Is Alive by Obama's Psychotic Syrian Rebels. I've gone on record for saying that I believe that both sides of this conflict are absolutely evil. Point is, we are funding the rebels. Would I be happier if we were funding the Syrian government? No. But we are funding the rebels. I'm going to go into one story of many. I mean, those of you that know, our editor, poor Anthony Court. I posted a picture of a man getting his head grilled because these were the same tribes, the same people that I'm reporting on here are the ones that did that. I asked Anthony, poor, poor Anthony Court, ask Court whether or not Sam has been on this. Um, I'm going to give the poor man a heart attack one day. Um, this is, this is important, people, because we're funding people that do things like this. In the village of Estriba, they massacred all of the residents and burnt down their houses. In the village of Alacrata, almost all of the 37 locals were killed. Only 10 people were able to escape. They butchered a town of 37 people? 37 people are such a threat. I'm sorry, 37 people means you messed up and the club's not going to ask your band to come back in my room. A total of 12 Alawite villages were subjected to this horrendous attack. That was a true slaughterhouse. People were mutilated and beheaded. There is also a video that shows a girl being dismembered alive. Alive! by a frame saw. The final death toll exceeded 400, with 150 to 200 people taken hostage. Later, some of the hostages were killed and their deaths were filmed. Again, it also goes along where it says in the Daily Mail, terrified Christians claim Syrian rebels ordered them to convert to Islam on pain of death, or they, liberate, or they would be liberated from their ancient village. Guys, let me tell you something. The book of Revelations, and you can laugh all you want to, 
I'm just going to put it out there, of two things that are fact. I'm not asking anyone to be a Christian. I'm just going to put two things out there that are absolutely historical fact, and I will let you draw your own conclusions. Revelations warned that if you did not convert to accepting uh, the mark of the beast, the new world order, whatever you want to call it, then you would be beheaded. And when I was growing up, many Christian teachers would say, you know, that could be interpreted as being shot. That could be interpreted as basically losing your life for the sake of not converting. No. The Bible said beheaded. Fact number one. Fact number two. In 2013, we have many, many ways of killing people that are not involving beheading. However, since as someone named Mohammed, who for some reason people decided to bestow some great godlike abilities on, uh, even though he didn't raise himself from the dead, we have beheadings in 2013, exactly as predicted. For those of you that do not believe in Christianity and think that the last minute and a half of what I've said is utter BS, I, it's fine, I can accept that. I have this to say to you. I'm sure you agree that we do not need to be involved in Syria where we have two barbaric evil sides in a civil war. Let them kill each other. This is what they have brought upon themselves. And I think a lot of people would agree with that. I don't mean to be callous, but we cannot help there. I'm going to go ahead and zip into this story if I can get my mouse to work. And that's quite a big F. There we go. IAEA boss says Fukushima water leak is urgent. I've been saying this forever. Miss Milky the Clown, Lauren Moray, Helen Colicott, Helen Colicott, Artie Gunderson, uh, the Fukushima Diary. Now people are finally listening to us. International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Yakaya Amano on Monday characterized the leak of radioactive water at the crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant as a matter of high priority that needs to be addressed urgently. Amano pledged to send a team to Japan in this autumn to deal with the increasingly worrisome problem. Meanwhile, plant operator TEPCO announced, and that is GE who you should be boycotting, Samples taken from the well near the site tested positive for the presence of radioactive substances, including strontium. Before I give you the numbers that are in this uh, article, let me go ahead and say real quick, they don't mention this, but it's true. It's bad. Go to Fukushima Diary. They'll tell you all about it. Uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a, a baby analogy here so that you understand it. Um, because I don't mean because my listeners are dumb. I mean because a lot of people are learning this for the first time. Let me clarify. Let's say that I have three radioactive pebbles here. And no three pebbles can hurt you by making you sick for two weeks. And I tell you that I need you to work around these and I'm going to pay you a set amount, which converts to $10 an hour. I'm not kidding. Uh, I, I will pay you $10 an hour to be around this. And you come to clean it up. And then you find out that there were actually 27 pebbles here. But I didn't see the other ones. And now, I'm sorry, you could actually get cancer. You're not just going to be sick for a couple weeks. And that's what happened to these people. Before I give you the numbers, when they say that they found it, yeah, they found it after they already had workers working around it. So that can't not be overstated. Reports produced by TEPCO, GE, admit radioactive water from leaking storage tanks has contaminated groundwater and reached the sea. The level of radiation at the well was measured at 3,200 becquerels per liter. That is a reaction that happens inside of your body per second. 3,200 reactions per second. Any one of those reactions can trigger a cancer mutation at any point in your life, every day in your life. The company announced last week that it discovered 650 becquerels per liter of radioactive waste in a well located approximately 20 meters south of the leaking storage tank. There's only two paragraphs left, and judging by the attention I get when I do Fukushima, you guys want to hear it, which is wonderful because this matters. Last week, the Japanese government said that it plans to build, by 2015, a wall of ice under the plant to stop drainage of contaminated water. 
In other words, I, for those of you that haven't followed this, it's leaking downhill and they're storing the tanks uphill because the plant that melted down is on the ocean, which was an asinine idea to begin with. And they were pre-warned. The plant calls for burying refrigeration pipes 100 feet underground for nearly a mile around the radioactive site to prevent water from escaping. Ice barrier technology was used at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee to contain radioactive wastewater. The Fuku Ice Barrier Project, however, is 150 times larger than the one at Oak Ridge. It says the energy requirement would be equivalent to the electricity used by thousands of households. Oh, no, no, no. That can't be true because it's just so much better. Don't you know that the, the, the power plants save us an absolute fortune, Sam? Yeah, they save us a fortune, all right. If you want to eat up uh, tons and tons of uh, electricity, which would not have been caused by a gas or electric plant, and then bring yourselves, by all means, a nuclear reactor or four to melt down. Guys, do me a favor, go to TheMediaSpeaks.com and click on Bud K. When you do, and you purchase something from them, you will be helping us. And they have everything. The camping and survival is particularly interesting because there's not much summer left. There really isn't at all. And they've got camping stoves, sleeping bags, first aid kits, camping utensils, Saws, shovels, tents, survival books. I don't think you're going to need a survival book if you go camping, but you never know. The point is, everything you could possibly need to enjoy the last of your summer, the last of the, the, the warm weather. It's happening now. So make sure you go to Bud K, get everything you need from them, and know that when you do so, that you're helping the correct views. And you're helping the media speaks. You're helping us grow and you're helping us to keep doing what we're doing now. And that only happens if you click off Bud Gay from the media speaks. So please do that. Um, and this is from Reuters.com. The Great Debate. Uh, I thought this was interesting. I couldn't just let this article lie. Why a medieval peasant got more vacation time than you. And this matters. Because... While some people say that Europe gets too much vacation time off with an average of like three weeks, their productivity is higher, their morale is higher, their turnover is lower, and basically they get more work done working less. Uh, I'm fortunate enough that I work Monday through Thursday where I work and then my band or whatever and make extra money wherever I can. But I'm, I'm very fortunate. And you know what? I think I'm a lot more productive and a lot less burnt out than most people are. Um, if I get sick, I just take the time off, they trust me, and most people in America don't have it like that. I'm a DJ where I work, and I'm very, very lucky. But this is the way that America is going for most people, and I can tell you as somebody that used to work 60 hours and, and make absolutely nothing, and as somebody that makes a better money now working less, I can tell you that it does, in fact, work. It really does. Give somebody a fair wage and cut their hours down and they will be more productive than having more employees. It's just the way it's been proven to work. And I'm living proof of it, but I'm going to go ahead and get into this. Life for the medieval peasant was certainly no picnic. His life was shadowed by fear and famine. I don't need to tell you, well, I'm, I'm, most of you know history. But you might envy them in one thing, it says, vacations. Plowing and harvesting were back-breaking toil, but the peasant enjoyed anywhere from eight weeks to half a year off. But the church, mindful of how to keep a population from rebelling, enforced frequent mandatory holidays, and there's a link to it here. Weddings, wakes, and births might, seem, might mean a week off, quaffing ale to celebrate, and then wandering jugglers or sporting events came to town, the peasant expected time off for entertainment. There were labor-free Sundays, and when the plowing and harvesting seasons were over, the peasant got time to rest, too. He should. He just fed the whole kingdom. In fact, economist Juliet Shore found that during periods of particularly high wages, such as the 14th century England, Peasants might put in no more than 150 days a year. As for the modern American worker, you might ask, after a year on the job, they get an average of eight vacation days annually, constantly referred to as she, that's a moronic, I'm not going to do it. 
It wasn't supposed to turn out this way. John Maynard Keynes, one of the founders of modern economics, made a famous prediction that by 2030, advanced societies would be wealthy enough that leisure time, or rather than work, would characterize national lifestyles, and it says so far that forecast is not looking good. I would certainly say that it's not. When I worked at Yellow Cab, I made nothing, and Fred Nero was a greedy jerk. It wasn't supposed to turn, I read that already. What happened is some cite the victory of the modern eight hour a day, 40 hour work week over the punishing 70 to 80 hours of a 19th century worker spent toiling as proof that we are in fact moving in the right direction, but no. Americans have long since kissed the 40 hour work week goodbye, and Shore's examination of work patterns revealed that the 19th century was an aberration in the history of human labor. When workers fought for the eight-hour workday, they weren't trying to get something radical and new, but rather simply to restore what their ancestors has enjoyed before industrial capitalists and the electronic light bulb came into the scene. Go back two or three, four hundred years and you will find that most people did not work very long hours at all. In addition to relaxing during long holidays, the medieval peasant took his sweet time eating meals and the day often included time for an afternoon snooze. The tempo of a low life was slow, even leisurely. The pace of work relaxed, and our ancestors may not have been rich, but they had much leisure and were more productive. In other words, pushing people to make seven, ten dollars an hour for 39 hours a week with no vacations and no benefits will give you less work and less productivity than paying the worker $15 an hour, giving him benefits and vacation time. He will work for you and you will be very pleased. It's not even an American issue. It's historically been proven to be so. I'm going to go ahead to this uh, from InfoWars Adams. Adam, I think it means Adam, that's a typo. It says Adam Salazar. I have so many typos again, I'm not going to go into it. Impeach Obama, add to run in Washington Times. This is such wonderful news. Hey, hey. Um, a coalition of black citizens united under the banner of the National Black Republican Association. Oh, but they're prejudiced. No, they're black. Right are reportedly planning to run an ad in today's edition of the Washington Times detailing why President Obama should be impeached. Not only are they black, they are wonderful Americans. The group said it planned to deliver the newspaper to each member of Congress when they reconvene today. Yeah, I bet you Nancy Pelosi's gonna love hers. Uh, yeah. Richard Swear, well, she might not get one. Richard Swear, editor of the conservative site Watchdog Wire, issued the announcement. According to Swear, the Florida based National Black Republican Association has sent articles of impeachment to the Judiciary Committee and the White House of Representatives. The NBRA has decided to publish an advertisement in the Washington Times and to provide a copy of the ad for every member of Congress as they return to work. We, black American citizens, as the letter begins, in order to free ourselves and our fellow citizens of government tyranny, do herewith submit these articles of impeachment to Congress for the removal of President Barack H. Obama, a.k.a. Barry Sotaro, from office for his attack on liberty and a commission, a, an agree, a commission of egregious acts of despotism that constitute high crimes and misdemeanors. In other words, not only has he let down most of America, I mean, I'm not even going to pretend to be able to relate to this. African Americans, more than anyone, and my dad went to his grade saying he really wanted to see an African American do a wonderful job. And I'm not prejudiced. I would vote for uh, Walter Williams as president as fast as I would vote for Gary Johnson, which I did last election. Obama has let everyone down, but I don't think he's let anybody down as much as the black community. And unfortunately, many of the black community are too interested in knowing what Usher's doing this week. 
other than what Obama did last week, and it's a shame because he's not only destroying black culture, but he's destroying America. And it's very nice to see that not everybody drinks his Kool-Aid. I'm going to go ahead and zip into this as my last article. Almost closed it. This is from the Natural Society. Single serving of coconut oil may boost brain health and reverse Alzheimer's. Natural Society, Christina Sarich. Um, somebody that I care about very much. Her husband has Alzheimer's. And she said something, and oh, this makes me mad. She said, Sam, there's no curing it. Okay. I never said we cure it. It reverses a lot of its issues. And it lessens the nastiness of Alzheimer's. And it doesn't cure you, but it makes you better to the point where in many instances, simply taking this coconut oil will extend your life and your quality of life so far that Alzheimer's probably won't even kill you, something else will. And I can't stress this enough. If you know anyone that's got Alzheimer's, please do me a favor and make them read this because I have been trying forever to get more people to just simply look at the logic that is in this. There are study after study after study. Perhaps you already know about the numerous health benefits of coconut oil, it says, but were you aware that as little as one daily serving, the medium chain triglycerides, MCT, or, quote, healthy fats in coconut oil may start to repair slow neural pathways and improve cognitive functioning and memory. This is true of people of all ages, but especially senior adults. The connection between coconut oil and Alzheimer's prevention and even a reversal has been made stronger than ever, as evidenced in recent articles like the one published by the journal Neurobiology and Aging. And it goes on to talk about why healthy fats are important. You can read that. You otherwise believe me that they are. It says the primary triglyceride found in coconut oil is lauric acid, which is found abundantly in a mother's breast milk. To build a strong body, especially a well-functioning brain, one that doesn't listen to Usher, you need fatty acids along with balanced glucose levels, full chain amino acids, and important micronutrients can keep your brain functioning at high levels from cradle to grave. Consuming coconut oil is a great way to boost not only brain health but overall health as well. Guys, there you have it. Show this to someone you love and show them that you love them. You are listening to The Correct Views, Sam I.B. Degay and G. signing off. Uh, go to TheMediaSpeaks.com, look up the work of Kyle Court, D. Lake, and myself. We all have videos and articles written as well. Um, for those of you waiting for me to do the Skinny Puppy cover, I am still going to do it. Um, DJ Aram and I have talked out a way to make it sound better than just an air recording. I'm going to go ahead and put the actual song as its own track, and then I'm going to do one take but I'm going to do the one take audio. I'm going to go ahead and use a lot of different camera angles and uh, whatnot so that you know it looks better. I don't just want to put junk up, but I am still going to do the Skinny Puppy song. I also am working on a new Passing Time video because we just played the Cleveland Music Fest. So it's going to be a little longer than I wanted to get the Skinny Puppy video up, but I am going to do the Skinny or Puppy cover as uh, promised. Passing Time is playing Old Haunts on the 21st of September, and we hope to see you there. Good night, friends. God bless. Thank you for listening. Please donate if you can. Every penny you give me, I put into this show. And uh, make sure you go to the Charity Connection and donate whatever you can to Miss Mobley Christ because she runs the Charity Connection, and she's recovering from lung cancer. We need to make sure she beats it. Good night, friends. Thank you.